black Hispanic communities, they're being taken advantage of every day because they simply just don't understand money. Because we're not talking politics, we're not talking money, we're not talking marriage, but yet our country is dealing with those issues presently. We taught to go to school, make the good grades, and work our way up corporate. Is that really going to create wealth for us? People don't know how to accelerate their income. Everyday families today are, are affected by inflation. Their jobs are letting go of them based on seasonal situations and things like that. Procrastination is your arrogant way of thinking that God owe you more time to do what you had time to do. You know, when you're usually with friends and family, it's like, hey, Mac, hey, cuz, check out what I got. Look what I'm wearing. Look what I'm driving. Versus wealthy families. Hey, man, this is what I'm building. My sister ended up being my first client, and then she had a car accident in Beckerfield. She passed away two hours later. I was able to deliver that check. That was the day that life insurance went from my mind to my heart, and I said, this is what I want to do for a living. What's cracking, like everybody? Mighty smart guy, Matt Paul here, hailing to you from Fort Lauderdale here, live from our Million Point Bay Shop Retreat, our annual annual tradition here to kick off every year to get together before the year ends, and business plan to make sure our ladies and gentlemen here are running a million dollar business for the year going forward. So, with that being said, um, I'm excited about this because uh, people are wondering what type of community we created here with the Seven Fear Squad YouTube channel. Uh, all we do here on the YouTube channel is just document what we're doing here live. You know, this is not something we just started because of social media. We've been doing this for years, entrepreneurship for years. This is eighth, our eighth year now running a million dollar retreat. Uh, in many years in the past, you've seen it in a previous episode, we've been in Ojica Castle, we've been in Puerto Vallarta, we've been in uh, uh, um, Arnold, uh, 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 Sylvester Stallone's former home in Palm Springs. So we've been to some crazy, lo crazy locations all across the United States of America. So with that being said, I want to help introduce our guys and gals here across the country that's come here to Fort Lauderdale to train with us, to learn with us, to mastermind together with us here in a Million Point Bay Shepherd Tree. So with that being said, Spring, want to kick us off? I'm Spring Eatman. Curtis Eatman. <laughs> and we are originally from California and now living in the Dallas area. Yeah. So happy to be here. So excited. Home of career. Yeah, so uh, we, I used to be in hospital administration. We also did a little dabbling in modeling. Um, but that's a whole nother life of <laughs> <laughs> And now in the greatest industry that there really is. Yeah, pro, uh, pro athlete and now entrepreneur. So. Get out, baby. Cool. Also. Yeah, so this is Alonso Aguilar, Modesto, California. And then my background is field workers. So I was picking grapes before joining the insurance industry. Then here we are today. Picking grapes. Picking grapes. Red, uh, uh, red uh, um, Purple or or or, <laughs> or, or what? All, ta all uh, type of grapes, my man. All type of grapes. <laughs> we don't discriminate in California. There's all type of uh, grapes in California. You said Modesto. Modesto, California. Is that where my, my uncle there, uh, Larry Italian, helped the, uh, yes. the, the the Cesar Chavez? Cesar Chavez. The whole riots and. and well, actually, when I came to the United States, I came to Bakersfield, California, yeah. and then because of business, I moved to Modesto this year. Love it. Very cool, man. Excellent. Brittany. So I'm Brittany Williams. Uh, come from an accounting background. Mississippi born and raised, but currently reside in Dallas, Texas. Yep. Kendrick Williams, how y'all doing? Good morning. Good morning. Good, good. So uh, mental health background before that, um, you know, went to Grandma State, got recruited to actually play baseball. A lot of people don't know that. Um, and just very competitive, just always been in my spirit, my heart, just to, to win. So um, mental health now in the financial services industry and, and loving what we're doing here. Yep. Iris Santiago from Chicago. Prior to PHP, I was a banker trying to help people with their finances until the assistant boss said, I pay you to open up checking account and credit cards and that's to help people with their money. And so I got into the money game. Mm. Uh, Enoch Santiago, Chicago, Chicago, Illinois, Humble Park specifically, uh, former aviation security, worked in the airport for 14 years and never traveled anywhere before the insurance industry. Is that the same as, uh, <laughs> is that the same as TSA? It is. TSA. So these water bottles, I'm a little, little trauma right now with all the water bottles going on. <laughs> so he's the guy yelling at you, get your laptop out your bag. I got you. Okay, very good. Okay. Uh, good morning. My name is Omar Delangelo. Uh, super happy, to, excited to be here with Money Smart Man. There you go. Money Smart Guy. Um, I come from Fresno, California. And, you know, my former background was in mechanical engineering. And I didn't see myself behind a screen for, you know, for majority of the day, man. And I got into the insurance industry. And... I work here alongside my spouse, uh, here Miss Miss Diana. Good morning. So my name is Diana Delanjo, and I actually come from the medical field as well. Good morning. My name is Jay Young, and I actually came from uh, the engineering background with a little little dabbling in insurance, life insurance, 
Uh, we're out in Little Rock, Arkansas, and I'm in business with my wife here. Awesome. So happy to be here. My name is Julia Young, Dr. Julia Young, and I have a background in banking and insurance, left at corporate America, went into education, doing educational psychology. I'm originally from Minneapolis, Minnesota, but I currently reside in Little Rock, Arkansas. That's awesome. So Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, I'm in Dallas now, and Jerry Jones is from uh, Little Rock, Arkansas. Yes. Yeah. And what a lot of people don't know about Jerry Jones, before he built a career in oil and gas and built the Dallas Cowboys, he built Frisco, Texas, basically. That's right. He was selling life insurance. That's right. So, all right, who, who wants to jump in? I've got the first question. Um, what were some of the things that people told you about building your side hustle, about doing something on the side differently than being uh, in your, your career, differently than, than your current profession that you may have studied for, that you e got educated on? And, and, and may somebody have either given you pushback or given you praise, which one would it be? Well, I'll jump in first. I definitely, my family thought I was crazy. <laughs> they were like, you, because I didn't get a chance to go and finish school. I started my family very young. And being in that position, um, you know, working my way up from starting off as a receptionist, so on-call float part-time receptionist. So somebody had to call off work for me to have a job that day. So working my way into hospital administration, um, it was one of those things that they were just like, are you crazy? Like, don't do that. And um, being that I was also a single mom at the time, um, I had people telling me, you're being a bad mom. You're leaving your, your kids to go and do this, you know, side hustle thing and, and play business. And uh, over time, they've seen how much we've grown. I was able to retire myself um, out of a, a great position um, in my 20s. And now they're like, we always knew you would do it. <laughs> you. Right, that's hilarious. Oh, by the way, before we go, Alonso, I know you want to jump in, but why did you start a side business? What's up at the side hustle? Uh, there was two things. One, I'm a product of this industry. So um, I was previously married. My first husband unfortunately passed away in an accident at 26 years old. Um, and I was pregnant at the time. I had a three-year-old daughter and I just didn't, there was not enough money uh, from just what I was doing, um, even in my corporate job, to be able to cover the lifestyle that I needed to cover. And so um, I was interested in looking for something to help me to subsidize because I was used to having two incomes. Um, and then once I uh, got involved in the industry, I started off as a client because I needed what we had. Um, and then I started to see how much money could be made here and the education opportunity and you know the lifestyle, all the things. And so the industry found me, baby. Love it, love it, very good. <laughs> So in my case, Matt, uh, it's a little bit different. But I came to the US when I was 17, and then I went back when I was 20. Because since when, when I was eight years old, I was diagnosed with leukemia. So and in Mexico, where I grew up, life insurance doesn't exist. So that part is specific in Sinaloa, Mexico. Life insurance is not even a thing. So when we when I came to this country and, and life insurance was introduced to me, I came for an interview. And instead of me saying, this is not for me, for me it was something new. I never heard about this before. So I said, you know what? Uh, and most of my people, most of my family, they said, I don't want to do this because it's something new for me. And then to me, I was like, well, I don't want to be 60 years old and still saying this is not for me and not knowing about it because there's a huge lack of financial education, especially in the Hispanic uh, uh, families in California. So I said, you know what? Uh, I talked to one of my coaches, Alejandro. He did my interview. He said, well, you have two options when you're 50 years old. Either you're gonna keep, you're gonna be saying I don't know anything about this, or you can say, well, I just came from Mexico. I bought the business and insurance industry. You're like, but one day you're gonna be 50 years old. You gotta choose. I don't know anything, or I'm an expert on this. And then you know, at that time in California, I didn't speak the language, so I had to learn the language in order for me to get this license. Wow. And I said, it took me almost a year for me to get this license. And ever since, well, uh, uh, my aunt passed away. She was my second client. She passed away. And that was the first time, and my, one of my uncles had passed away two years prior to that. And I saw how my whole family was doing a car wash, my mom making tamales, uh, for us to collect the money. And then when I got my license, my aunt passed away, I was able to deliver that check because she was working with me. She was my packer in the fields when I was packing grapes. And I was the one cutting the grapes, and then she was the one packing the grapes. Wow. So she was my partner. And she would always believe in me. She's like, mijo, 
you're gonna get your license, don't give up, don't give up. I took the test six times, well, five times, and I paid for it six times. But, and she told me I'll be your first client. My sister ended up being my first client, she ended up being my second client, and then she had a car accident in Beckerfield. She passed away two hours later, and then I was able to deliver that check to my cousins. Wow. And then that was the day that that laughing insurance went from my mind to my heart, and I said, this is what I wanna do for a living. Wow. Yeah. But my family's always been very supportive when it comes to this. So how many people in your family actually previous to you getting involved in the insurance industry nobody. had life insurance nobody um nobody nobody in and and in, in my family the highest income earner in my family at that time uh it was one of my cousins with thirty six thousand dollars a year and then uh my brother was the first one to graduate at university now he's he's a counselor at a prison uh my brother but before that, nobody, nobody in my family. By the way, nobody in my family had a life insurance before I came into the industry. Nobody. Right now, every single person in my family is, is insured. There you go. Would you care to share with everybody what you're making in the last 12 months? Uh, yes, almost $200,000. Is, so, any, is anybody in your family making close to that? No. I, I would say, I would say my, my closer would be my brother for like 120 but other than that. And my income in 2017, before coming to the insurance industry, my highest income was $27,000 a year. That's what I was okay, making. Here, here's a crazy conversation. Your number one amongst your friends and family, when you come into an environment like this, though, <laughs> how do you feel? Uh, well, I feel like I, I, well, I see you, right? <laughs> I see you making all this money, and, and now I'm here and I look at all these beautiful homes, and I'm like, I just can't wait for me from going for $250,000 this year for next year to go to a million dollars because, because I just want to be the first millionaire out of my family. And there you go. For those of you watching that, that was a gem right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For those of you watching that, was a gem. Jay, Julie, did you want to jump in? I walked away from my job before coming into the financial industry in the role that I'm in now. Yeah. But I remember walking away because I just didn't like, I was felt trapped and I felt like I wasn't growing. Yeah. And I remember I was walking away from my full-time job and we were at my mom's house and my mom said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. And she looked at me like I was crazy and she looked at my husband and she said, is, is she serious? <laughs> and Jay said, yeah, mom, she's serious. And so now today, my mom has been in business with us for three years. <laughs> she's 75 years old, has her license. Yeah. And she be prospecting for us. So she loves that we can't get rid of her. She hasn't missed any of our big events. Like, she's she's not going anywhere. I love it. <laughs> Very good. Cool. I got into the federal government, and um, seven years into my career, I'm capped out. I'm not even 30 years old. So then the conversation at the airport was like, we'll get into real estate. Real estate's coming back after the, you know, the crash in 08. Especially Chicago. Chicago's a hot real estate market. Yes. Yep. So uh, I, didn't have, I didn't have any money, but I had my, my 401k, my TSP. So I remember taking about 15 grand out of my TSP, and in about two, three years, I had three doors, you know, worth about a quarter mil. Um, but I was capped out again. So I said, okay, corporate America capped me in seven, real estate capped me in three, and then I, you know, I got introduced to the industry by my beautiful wife, and uh, coming up on five years now, and I feel like I'm not moving fast enough, you know. So for me, entrepreneurship was that journey um, that was growing faster than I was. And as far as support from my family, I remember, um, you know, really trying to figure this thing out: should I do it? Should I not? And one of my sisters goes, just give it six months. Go all in, give it six months, forget everybody's opinion, get your own opinion. And she was actually my first client too, you know, my sister when I got licensed. So I got started in the industry uh, in my 20s. I was 23 when I started with Matt, right? And so here I'm 23, single mom. You know, no one tells you that the most important decision you're gonna make is the person you get married to outside of your relationship with God. A lot of this has been such a journey, but I'll tell you, my brother was a big person who uh, growing up, we were both adopted by my grandmother. He was like a father figure. So his opinion weighed so much on me. And he's like, you're crazy. You're a single mom. What are you doing? I got that too. Spring, you're a bad mom. You know, um, you should get a corporate job with benefits. And I'm like, you guys don't understand that a corporate job is not going to get this family to where we need to be. And so I had to make a lot of decisions for five years. I followed up with him. Today, he runs uh, our licensing and operations. <laughs> he was a five-year follow-up, and he, he was the first person to get gear with our, with our logo on it, with TNT organization. And he's a, he, he, I can't get, he now he's using his license, and we can't get him just like you from the field. But um, even with my sister-in-law, Rachel, I was so afraid to talk to Rachel. Uh, she was my best friend growing up, and today she makes six figures running the Las Vegas office. So I just believe that a visionary has to stick to their vision, despite my entire family, you know, being in the industry now going on a decade, not believing, 
You just got to stick to it because you see a vision they can't. So there's, there's a report out there that by 2020, um, and this actually went before the pandemic, that black and Latino households stand to lose nearly 18% and 12% of wealth they'd held in 2013 respectively, while medium white household will increase by 3%. At that point, just three years from now, white households are projected to own 86 times more wealth than black households and 68 times more wealth than Latino households. So there's this conversation, whether it's in the news or whether it be politically charged, that there's this wealth gap that black and Latino households can't do anything about it. You, like your, your forecast is just to be broke. You're, I think the net worth, another report said net worth in black Latino households by 2053 and basically the 2050s will be zero. So what, what do you think is happening in your communities, in the black and Latino homes that you guys are sitting across the kitchen tables from? of why the, these type of prog uh, reports and progressions are being reported? I would say, number one, especially when we're in the field and we're talking to everyday families, and the conversation has been, well, no one's ever told me about this. Well, the reality is if you don't have representation in, your, in this industry to be able to share this information, then how would you know it? You're talking about the financial services industry? talking about financial services. This is the game of money, yeah. period. Yeah. You know? So I think the, the fact is that people don't know how to accelerate their income you know, everyday families today are, are affected by inflation. Their, mm -hmm. their jobs are letting go of them based on seasonal situations and things like that. So I remember, <clears throat> excuse me, I remember my mentor telling me this, and that if you don't understand money, it's a 100% chance that you're being taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. And the reality is you're talking about black Hispanic communities, they're being taken advantage of every day because they simply just don't understand money, right? And so for me, it's, it's been, you know, like how can we help this everyday families become superheroes now? and understand that entrepreneurship is the key, not just to provide for survival, because that's what the job's always been for us, but provide for purpose. And so I think that is like the key, but a lot of people only see certain things. Like, you know, where I'm from, like you only saw, like if you play sports, that was your way out, right? Or you were supposed to be on the corner, you know, selling drugs, or you're supposed to be part of a gang, or you're supposed to maybe go to school, get a scholarship, but then you don't know, like, like then what? Right, but you never were like, oh, this is the business owner I'm supposed to be like, or you didn't really see many examples outside of that, yeah. right? So I think now that even this table is kind of showing that these examples are here, yeah. and now this microphone is getting bigger and bigger and as well, so. Right. It's interesting, because you know, when you're usually with friends and family, it's like, hey, Mac, hey, cuz, yep. check out what I got. Mm -hmm. uh, look what I'm wearing. Yeah. Look what I'm driving, blah, 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 versus wealthy families. Yeah. Hey man, this is what I'm building. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Different and conversations. These are the problems that we're finding out, and then here's the solutions. We need to great. You want to get in on it? Yeah. You know, let's let's lock arms and do it. Yeah. So yeah. cool. Anybody? Anybody else want to? Yeah, I, I, I think um, success um, in, in our community is, um, and everybody can probably agree is, um, we taught to go to school, right? Make the good grades and work our way up corporate. Is that really going to create wealth for us? Or is it still going to put us in a cycle of you know, paycheck to paycheck, uh, student loan debt, whatever the case may be, and and just how we perceive how we perceive that is, um, we did what our parents told us to do, yeah. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Which was get that get that education, get that good job, own your house, get a nice car, start a family. That's success. But in, in, in a nutshell, that doesn't create wealth, if that makes sense. So this industry that we're in, like like Curtis just said, when we talking to everyday families, they they never heard of this. They never heard of this industry because uh, before the pandemic, I was getting into real estate investing, and I used to pay two three thousand dollars for conferences just to go learn from the real estate gurus, mm -hmm. right? But now um, I'm able to get mentorship from Matt and you know our sidelines and different things like that, so that we can grow in this business. But uh, yeah, that's. I, I think um, just like you say, talking to every everyday families, um, they just don't know about this industry and how uh, when we learn the game of money, we can get ahead. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So I remember going to a, a leadership class and it was like, there's things you know, like we know, I know English, I know Spanish. There's things you don't know. I know I, know I don't know Chinese, but there's a part of our brain that you don't know because you're not aware that you don't know it. And I think that's the part that we need to bring awareness to first in order for somebody to play the game they need to know the rules mm -hmm. and in order for no they need to even know what game they're playing so in the money game if it's not being taught because we're not talking politics we're not talking money we're not talking marriage but yet our country is dealing with those issues presently yeah. 50 percent divorce rate right marriages are, are are not understanding how to communicate with one another 
politics. We're voting left or right, not even understanding why we're voting just because our family told us to vote a certain way. And when it comes to money, it's that taboo subject, especially in the Latino household, where they say, hey, we don't talk about that. But why you can't talk about what we don't have, right? Wealthy people talk about money, politics, and marriage. So when I got into the industry and realizing, wow, there's just a lack of education, and you can't make everyone, I, I like, uh, who says that you, not everybody deserves to be rich, but no one deserves to be poor? Joe right? Jordan. Joe, Joe Jordan. Joe Jordan. Yeah. And I think that's the, that's the awareness part is how many families can we educate? Because really, the more I read in the industry, like right now I'm obsessed with reading more financial books than ever because I want to be not just a student of the business. I understand the power of having education, right? And so assets versus liabilities, I think the black and brown community have been uh, gone through a, a slavery, gone through oppression, and now are trying to find out how to survive. And if you never get out of survival, then you're not going to talk about assets versus liabilities. So it makes sense that the net worth is going to be zero because assets is going to be zero if you don't understand real estate, life insurance, you know, the money game, uh, uh, when to get into the market right now, it's the recession. So I just think that we got to start one family at a time, but give them the blueprint and then let them make that decision. You talk about kitchen tables. There's one of our clients. Uh, I grew up with him, Humble Park, looks like us, but he spent 15 years and disappeared and built an IT tech company from scratch. Today, his clients are Visa, Walmart, the state of Michigan, and he lives in Naperville. Like, he did good for himself and his family, you know? And uh, we were just breaking down some stuff to him. He goes, you know what? I travel to California to be around CEOs that have these conversations, and they're telling me what you're telling me, but they want to charge me to have a deeper conversation. He goes, and then I'm playing golf with these guys, and I say, well, who taught you? Oh, my uncle taught me. Oh, my dad taught me. Oh, this is the conversations we have at Thanksgiving dinner, but they want to charge us to have those conversations. Ma Y'all seem very triggered with this question. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I agree to disagree on this one. In, in, our, in our case, uh, or the Hispanic community, when you come to this country, uh, and you come to this country and you feel less. It, it could be an identity issue. It could be uh, it's, everything is new for you. Uh, but in, in, in my situation, when I came to this country, I didn't speak the language. Uh, most, of my, most of my family, they don't speak the language. So when you come to this country, and it's a normal life for you to be broke. It's normal for you to be living paycheck to paycheck. And that is because you're always comparing yourself to someone that, in, that is doing less than you. So as long as you're doing better than the person that is doing less, right? Uh, you don't, that's, that's all you know. But then- Versus reaching up. Is, okay. Instead of going up. Like, okay. like in, 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 in my situation, um, when, I, when I sit down with families and they feel that they're good because they compare themselves to the lifestyle that they had in Mexico. Mm -hmm. So in Mexico, maybe they, they, they struggle with money, they struggle with food, maybe they don't have money to pay the rent, and they come to the U.S., especially in California, and you work in agriculture, construction, and you work in like all these jobs that nobody wants to take by you, but that's also your fault. Because at one point, we gotta take ownership. At one point, we gotta say like, hey, I didn't leave my family in Mexico, my culture, my food. I didn't leave my friends. I didn't leave everything just for me to come to the U.S. and just, just be, and, and just also struggle financially in the U.S. But just because I feel that I'm living better, just because I have better food in my table than the food that I had in Mexico. So at one point, it's us, the ones that has to make the decision. And my mentor always says, it's about associations. Because I didn't know better until I met all of you guys, mm -hmm. right? I didn't know better until you started surrounding yourself with people that they have businesses, they have money, they know how to make money, they have wealth, they own all these properties. And for a lot of us, buying a house that you can even afford is the American dream, right? And then you come to this industry and say, no, the American dream is passive income, is residual income, is you being uh, having that freedom. For us, is for us the American dream. When I came to this country, it was now having freedom. For us, it's just having a better job, right? That that for us, that's America. Yeah, or a job. Or a job. <laughs> yeah, and, but as long as you're not working in the fields yeah. in the sun. Yeah. So for us, and my dad was always telling me like, just get a job where there's AC, yeah. so you don't have to be working outside. <laughs> you're sweating out, out, yeah. Out so if, so I was working at a warehouse, right, for a while, and at an office, I, I became a, the operator in that office and I was just doing all this stuff and I thought I had a good job, mm -hmm. but I was still making minimum wage, yeah. mm -hmm. right? So it's all about associations who you're talking to and also you start being confused and also making a decision like, hey, I don't come for money, but I don't want to die without money either. 
you know, and you got to take ownership and then build something for yourself and just find the right people, the right associations, the books that we're reading, the meetings that we're attending. But we can change that. I'm not a victim of anything. If a lot of people are struggling financially, that's my 400 percent. I got to do something about it. And I got to learn about money. I got to talk about politics. I got to talk about religion. We got to talk about God. We got to talk about marriage, values and principles. And something needs to talk about that, you know, and then in my situation, in my Hispanic community, I will be that guy. That's it. And said, by the way, it's so prevalent in the multicultural community to accept that you're a victim, that you are being oppressed, that you are something's being taken away because you're brown or black, that uh, you have less opportunity in America. And you guys are just an example like, you know, uh, I'm, and I'm not waiting for a politician to change my life. I'm changing my life. I decided to take initiative about this. Right. I want to jump in there, Matt. I disagree with the data as well. I'm, I'm just like you. I don't think they have all the data. I don't think they have all the facts because they're, they're not getting the information from our community. And because I come across a lot of people all the time that want to change yeah. their life and that want to be you're in Little Rock, Arkansas. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, it's a large black community. Correct. I presume. Rock, Arkansas. There's a lot of small black owned businesses. Yeah. Um, and so what I'm finding is there is a lack of education when it comes to how to run a business and how to have access to capital to help your business be successful, but it's not because people aren't wanting to do anything. As well, um, I, I see a lot of people that don't trust the banks, so they're not putting their money in the bank. So if they're using the bank data as a way to judge whether or not we have assets, that's, that's also going to be flawed data. So I just think they don't have enough information, and they're going to find they're going to be surprised 10, 20 years from now yeah. because with us right. and what we're doing in the community, yeah. and the more yeah. this information keeps spreading, the more that we're out there because we're part of the solution. So the more that we're out there sharing yeah. with people yeah. how to run properly run a business, how to reduce their taxation, yeah. how to save and grow their money, and how to build their assets, how to get, put trust in place. They're gonna. It's gonna be different. That data is gonna be different. They're gonna wake up and be like, "What happened? We didn't know this was going on in the black community." So yeah, my, my whole thing was uh, I, I was actually uh, in engineering for about 15 years before I jumped over into financial services. And how uh, did we know the engineers were sitting next to each other? <laughs> right, right. Did you guys know that? <laughs> <laughs> and so what happened, man, was my mom had a massive stroke back in 2000, and that that prompted me to make a change because we had four working adults from my that grew up in my household that were not able to help my mom when she had this stroke. And it's like, uh, we saw, you know, the fact that she was never able to go back to work before she passed away. Okay. And the fact that her 401k was gone in like two years. And I'm like, what could we have done to not have this as an issue? Mm -hmm. And so I jumped over and started learning what I could. Thank God for this opportunity that I ran across finally six years ago. Uh, because if it wasn't for that, man, I don't know uh, what we would have done, you know. Let's talk about data then. So instead of talking about the different racial or ethnic disparities. Uh, let's talk about the generational disparities. You guys are sitting across the kitchen table with people every day. You guys are educating people every day, every week, every month, every year about, about uh, financial literacy and, and, and life insurance. Let's talk about 401ks. So 401k in the Gen Z demographic, average savings in 401k balances, according to Fidelity, is $7,100 in a 401k. Median, $2,500. Um, my generation, the Generation X, average savings in 401k, 145,000, median 44,000. Millennials, 44,900, average savings in 401k, median 15,500. Is this data wrong? It's probably correct from what they're looking at. <laughs> but there's a lot of Gen Zs, they don't want to put their money in the bank. And so Gen Z. What's in cryptocurrency? <laughs> 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 it was. It was. Because oh. they're, 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 Google's educating them. Let's just be real. Google, Google, Instagram, TikTok is educating them. So they're they're knowing that there's other alternative ways of, for them to be able to save and grow their money, as well as they don't want to work a full time job, and they don't want to work until they're 50 and 60 years, years old. So they're trying. They're working to figure out ways, how can I retire at 30? How can I retire at 35 and 40? Yeah, yeah. something else too is uh, when we know, when we look back and we see that uh, just in this industry, when we learn things like, uh, you know, they're, they're not being a gold standard uh, tied to the dollar anymore and things like that. And the shift of knowing that the 401k was not supposed to be used the way it's traditionally used right now. Uh, pensions going away, those type things. It's like, 
Uh, we didn't know as a society that we were going to be responsible for our own retirement. That's right. And it's, it's unfortunate, you know, but at the same time, we have to, like you know, like you said, we have to educate ourselves and we have to encourage our neighbors to educate themselves on these matters. So, so you have the, like, the three-leg stool, right, that they talk about, right? So old school, you got 90% of pensions eliminated, and then you're not teaching money in schools. So how are these millennials coming out? They live in the, the microwave world, right? If something's not done in 30 seconds, then I don't want it. So we're not teaching endurance. We're not having patience. We live in a society where media talks about the facade. And so it's, it's like the matrix. You got to break free from that. And, and that's where we come into play and educate. I, I, don't, I'm not, I think the data shows that there's a lack of trust. The data shows that uh, maybe people don't understand the 401k, right? And they don't understand that it's an IRS tax code. And so the lack of education, I think just millennials right now, being in school and so much debt, we forget that they're paying fifty to $100,000 in debt. They don't know what they want, right? And they get into all this massive debt. So, of course, there's not going to be any assets, and they're not saving because they're living up to their means. But I think that that is going to shift with PHP being where it's at and our company and only being um, saturating the market the way we are. And we're going to get to 500,000 licensed agents. We're going to have more boots on the ground. More families are going to be educated. So, again, I think that data is going to shift. Each, it's going to change significantly. Talk to us in 10 years. Let's see what it looks like. Wait, wait, Arisina, how much money did you guys make last month? Oh, uh, uh, Just 12000 Just 12000 <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. How much does the TSA guy make it? Oh, not 12000 <laughs> How much does the, wait, how much the <laughs> banker make it? How much do your top bankers make? I don't know. Three, three four grand. If they're, if they're barely scratching it, it's horrible. So even if you combined your incomes... Together, it would not equal what you guys made last month. You know, no. when I was, I remember when I was part time, we the, had a conversation about, you know, when to go full time. And I had made, I had made 10 grand part time. And uh, I thought about it. I did, sat down, did the math. What did it take at TSA to make 10 grand in a month? I would have to not pay taxes. I would have to get a raise, get a bonus, do overtime. I was on salary and an HR mistake all in the same paycheck. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> to make the, 10 grand. And Matt, just to your defense, it's just that you're in an environment, you guys like our environment which we we do take for granted you're sitting next to a guy who makes two hundred thousand dollars a month and you're making 12 grand and you're like man i'm broke you know what i mean i can't help the, all the families i want to help i can't give to the church what i want to give to right i can't retire my parents just yet because we're in this environment and so to, i was reminded yesterday coach i was sitting here and i'm like man we're so freaking blessed to be able to say man you know 12 grand is a really bad month and it would be somebody else's dream Right. But when you're in an environment where it increases your identity and, and you know what you're worth and you're not playing to your worth. Yeah. And just to add on to the, the 401k, how many times we sit down with a client like they, they literally people who have a 401k, they literally on track to work the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. Right. And we didn't know Good that point. until until we, we got the mentorship, got into this industry and understood the, how, how the 401k works. And then you think you have that money there. That money hasn't even been taxed yet. Bingo. Right? So so you think you have this nest egg, and then you get hit with taxes, you know, 20, 30, 40%, whatever that is, right? And and now um, we're, we're out there like like uh, um, boots on the ground, right, to, to get this information out. And and our, we need more people to, to educate our communities because, like I said, we went to school, got the good job, now what? Right? I, I've sat down with people who say, hey, I'm retired, but I still I work a part-time job. Either you ret you're retired or you're not. <laughs> yeah. Right? Right. You 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 guys ever like heard yeah. somebody retire, but they yeah. like, mm -hmm. oh, I, I drive left or I do you know, and give or yeah. take. Some people probably do that to stay busy, whatever the case may be, because yeah. they don't want to just retire and just yeah. you know die off. But um, I think most people retiring have to go, have to go back to work to make being to uh, yeah. make yeah. stuff work. Yeah, because yeah. they, they realize they run out, they yeah. run out of money. Yeah. What, what were you? What was your top income? With a master's degree in mental health, uh, sixty-eight annually. And what did you make last month? <laughs> Sixty-six. <laughs> <laughs> See what I'm saying, Matt? Yeah. Two dollars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All in sixty-six. Yeah. Is yeah. anybody in your family making that type of bread? No, not at all, man. It's it's and and like you said, sometimes you know our months, you know we we have great months, you know okay months, and then. Like like even I said we uh we you, you make twelve thirteen grand and it's like broke. we broke right <laughs> so, like, um, but but even that I mean you make thirty forty grand a month you're not even top five in the office so like, it's, it's crazy so it's just yeah Matt, going back to the four one k 
uh, didn't just the uh, CEO of the 401k just said that one of his biggest mistakes that he has made in his life was to actually create a 401k. And, Look at you from picking grips to educate yourself about the <laughs> creator of the 401k. Right. Uh, so and and everything goes back. Everything goes back to us because the 401k. Uh, first of all, when you sit down with families and then you talk to them about that, uh, first of all, they don't know what they have. Uh, they don't know how it works. Uh, they're like, no, I don't have to pay taxes. Well, they didn't tell me that. I said, well, they didn't tell you that because they, the HR, the one that actually signed you up for your 401k, they have no idea how it works either. They just get paid. That person just gets paid for you to fill out that form, but they don't know anything. So like, well, I talked to the HR. Well, you're not talking to, you're talking to another employee that all they're paying, all they're getting paid for is for them to fill out the form for you. You sign, but they don't know what they're doing. And everything goes back to the lack of financial education uh, uh, in our families on schools. They don't teach about schools. They, they don't teach about money. They don't teach about retirement plans. They don't teach about money. They don't teach about um, anything. That reason why right now uh, uh, that that uh, area what I'm what I live right now in Modesto, California, 34 percent of people uh, uh, in that city they don't have a thousand dollars in savings. A thousand dollars in savings. They don't have that. And I've been there, and, and I'm guilty about that uh, as well. But once once you start educating yourself and you understand uh, finances, you understand money, you understand. And and again, it goes back to you. You making that decision of wanting to learn about this. Uh, it doesn't matter. PHP, we can have 500,000 licensed agents. We can educate a lot of families as well. It is true. A lot of people, they don't, they don't have a better plan because they don't know about it. But also a lot of people, they're also skeptical about that. They're, well, they don't trust you. But do you trust the stock where you have your 401k? You don't know either. You don't know that, uh, you know? And and it's just, it just going back to like being broke and a skeptical is not a good combination uh, uh, at, <laughs> all. <laughs> at all. At yeah. all. And, and, and a lot of people stay there, you know, with that mindset. But it goes back to like you, if I came to this country, Right or, or or a lot of people keep saying that for Hispanics and, and African Americans, uh, they're the biggest on on the lack of financial education. Yes, it is true, but the numbers are going lower because we're not really talking. We're talking about the struggle, but we're not really talking about hey, this person is Hispanic is make a lot of money. Uh, this person is African American. Like like who are the biggest in sports? Who are the ones making the most money? African Americans. Right, so I think in, instead of edifying people that are not making money, we gotta start edifying people that are all, uh, as well making a lot of money. So a lot of people they have someone to look up to. Yeah. Instead of just we keep talking and talking, and, and I tell my family like, let's stop talking about how in the Hispanic community we're struggling financially. Mm -hmm. Why don't we start talking about Oscar de la Hoya? Why don't we start talking about my mentor? Why don't we start talking about people making a lot of money so we can switch that mentality, yeah. right? And then now people they know exactly where they're going. So now they're chasing people are making money instead of us building that mentality like, oh, we're broke. And we're supposed to be broke because we're supposed to because we're Hispanic, because we're African Americans. We gotta stop that. And we gotta stop that now. <laughs> Profound. You know, the, the thing here too is everything we buy, major purchases in America, we don't buy it with cash. We buy it with debt. You know, if you look at your homes, you don't buy it cash. Who buys a house cash? Especially from our demographics. Especially if you didn't come from money or didn't have an inheritance. You're not buying a house with cash. Um, you buy a car. It's not a major purchase, right? right? You don't buy it cash. Most people buy, buy it through financing. And the average car payment in America is 700 bucks a month. My first apartment in Orange County, California, when I was a Marine, was 600 bucks a month in OC in Orange County. Wow. Neighbors to you. Uh, if, uh, 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 San Santana, right, 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 by, uh, right, by, right by Rancho. Yeah. Um, education. You know, the average student isn't going to school with cash. They're financing. So three major things I just mentioned. Homes, cars, education is not bought with cash. It's financed. And back to credit card debt, it just finally crossed over a trillion dollars in credit card debt. Wow. And it, with rising interest rates, interest rates are working against people, not for people. So yeah. for those of you guys uh, sitting down with clients, and you sit down with people, you guys are doing your workshops on a weekly basis, credit card debt seems to be swallowing up, especially during the holiday season, where they talk to us as consumers, charging up credit card debt. Do you guys have any uh, strong opinions about yay or nay, uh, about that data, about that uh, fact? Because you guys are dealing with people on a daily basis. Yeah, I, I would say it's it's really sad because, um, you know, the last time I checked up, it's probably even worse now. But the average American household is in around sixteen thousand dollars of credit card debt mm -hmm. with no way to pay out of that. Um, they're just paying the minimums constantly mm -hmm. and they're going to be living and drowning and dying under that debt. 
right? And so it's 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 created for us to stay in that rat race. It's not created to help us. We think I think you know when when you first get your first credit card, it's like free money. They want to help me. I'm gonna be able to get an education. I'm gonna be able to buy a car, a house, all these things. And it's not to help you. It's to get you into these financial shackles where you're going to continuously uh, be paying these minimums and then drown and drown and drown. Um, and so if most people don't have the if you don't have the income to be able to pay for the thing that you're purchasing, yes. if you don't have it in your bank, then you probably shouldn't purchase it because you're you're putting yourself you're setting yourself up for that. Um, and, and just to go back to kind of what we've all been talking about as well, when we talk about especially this is very much uh, uh, targeted into the black and brown community. And, and I, I don't subscribe to the fact that we don't have income, we don't have money, because we, black and brown community are the number one consumer of everything. So the money is there when, when the entire country is depending on this demographic to keep the economy going, when it's the number one targeted uh, uh, demographic for you to sell to, then there is money there. It's just the education of where we're putting our money and what we're doing with our money. And unfortunately, our money's so tied up in this debt with credit cards and all these loans, right? Because that's how we're taught to deal with money. We're not ha taught how to utilize it for ourselves, but we're taught how to become a participant of it, right? And so um, it keeps us in that rat race. And so I think that we have to break out of that shackle, you know, start putting yourself uh, more disciplined. And and I think also we come from this like peacock background of like, you got to have the latest, you got to have the drip, the this and that. And so people are, 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 are borrowing a life style that they can't afford. Wow. Tell everybody right? what you guys made last month. Um, 41, right? Yeah, we made 41,000. 41,000? Uh -huh. right? Only. Only one 41,000? Yeah. Where, 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 where do you think you guys are ranked in, in, in the office? We, <laughs> we were like number four. No, it's like maybe five or six. Yeah. <laughs> That's sad, right? We're, yeah. we're, 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 we're not even the start at five. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I want to piggyback on that. So I, um, I'm reading a book recently, and it talks about how if you don't if you don't think money is important, then you don't love your family, and you don't understand the kingdom of God. And so, when it comes to credit card debt, it's a report card mm -hmm. that teaches you: Can the economy trust you? Mm -hmm. Can I trust you with a hundred dollars? If I can't trust you with a hundred, then I can't trust you with a thousand, and I can't trust you with a thousand. I can't trust you with $100,000 for your business. Yeah. And so money's all about stewardship and trust. Yeah. And the more I understand that today, I'm like, wow, when I first got my credit card, I was like, it's Victoria's Secret, come on girls, we're gonna go get some perfume, right? <laughs> and you think, like you said, Spring, you said it's money that you're spending that you can't even afford to spend. It's a, just a lack of understanding that it's a credit card, but it's a credit report. It's going to be a report card to see how much the economy can trust you. And if the economy can't trust you, then you're going to be in liabilities because you're a liability to the economy, right? Mm -hmm. You're not bringing any assets. And so it's, it's just like I, the more you understand it, the more you get into it, the more you realize, wow, we, the media wants us to be consumers, but we're in the information age. You got access to Google, books, libraries. There's no excuse. We just got to get educated. I remember getting my first credit cards and I went straight to collections. Okay. <laughs> I, like, I, like, you know, and I was trying to collections because I don't think the whole Hispanic community fits into this, uh, but majority can. Getting a credit card is bad for us. Like, don't get credit cards. Like, don't get credit cards because it's bad. And it's not because the credit card is bad. No, it's just because the lack of skills that you have when it comes to money. Uh, well, we don't know. And we try to get all these credit cards. Right now, in the Hispanic community, there's an average of 3.8 credit cards uh, per household. Uh, but yet, we think they're bad. I remember like when, when I got my first credit card and I was using it and using it, using it and using it. And I'm like, dude, I'm spending all this money, but I'm making $400 a week. How am I going to be able to pay uh, for that credit card? So I went straight to collections. I had like, I don't know how many collections I had at that time. And my dad and my mom they would get so mad at me because I, would get in those, I was getting those letters saying that I was in collections because I wasn't paying my credit cards. But because I didn't know better. I didn't know. I really thought it was free money uh, at that time. And, and then so I stopped using them. Uh, I fixed my credit. And then my whole, since I came here, I thought credit cards were bad. Mm -hmm. And then you talk to my coaches 
I talked to my coaches and I talked to you guys and you're like, no, credit is good. And I'm like, but I thought it was bad. But no, it's not the credit. If you're using credit for you to get into that, to live a life that you can even afford, yeah. right? And and when I do my BOMs, my, my business presentations, uh, um, I talk to people and like, it's just a lot of people that are just living a, a life uh, that they cannot afford, mm -hmm. right? And they're spending more money than the one they're actually making. Mm -hmm. And and I said, you know what? That was me as well, but that we're here for. So we can change that, but credit is good. It's not bad. And that's what the government's doing. Yeah. Right. That's right. right? This are, are both state and federal governments are showing that example. And <coughs> And, uh, and that's what's that's what's being modeled. All right. So uh, as we wrap up, guys, going into the next year, what's uh, what's one, two, or three things that people can do? Ten, twenty seconds, right? One, two, or three th things that people can do to start changing their life. First of immediately. All, guys, <coughs> number one, um, if you know, are you connected to anyone on here in this podcast, reach out. You know, closed mouths don't get fed. If you don't say, "Hey, help me," we're not. We don't charge for that education. But what you don't know is charging you and it's costing you. So I would say, number one, get educated. Number two, put yourself in a position to understand. Don't use something if you don't understand it, right? I wouldn't say go get a credit card if you don't understand how to use it. Go get into more debt if you don't understand the power of the decision you're about to make. So get educated, number one. Uh, I would just say, you know, if you want to know um, what your dreams and goals are, look at your evenings and weekends. And even before getting into the insurance industry, even before being an entrepreneur, I, I was at a point where I knew I needed more in life. And I was just studying, learning, reading, trying to figure out a way, you know, so take your idle time, take it out of the devil's hands and, and put it more towards the message towards the future. Be active in your, uh, your own rescue. You know, be more curious this year coming up, 24. Be more curious. Ask more questions. Educate yourself on the money game. That would be the number one thing that I would say. And, and then I'm, some people aren't going to agree with me. But stop paying off your house and you don't have anything in savings. Oh, yeah, because everything's going from liquid to illiquid. That's right. I love it. Yep. Um, I'm going to say change. I feel like a lot of people are afraid uh, to change, no. uh, to do uh, something new in life. They're just used to doing their everyday uh, daily activities um, or just being in that job uh, in corporate and not um, – living like a different uh dream they're just stuck in that same dream that they've been having for years mm -hmm. and they're just afraid of having something new or just seeing their family being like in the same position that they have been like us hispanic um it's always like a not like a competition but kind of a competition oh well this person's doing a little bit uh better than me but let me just work a little bit more and maybe buy something more expensive than what it's just in the in the uh, hispanic community it's just a lot of competition and they don't like to change it's just the same mindset yeah just, yeah i, I agree with that like um people have to be open to change man mm -hmm. uh, we we sit down with with people every day and you 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 we present this information and the opportunity mm -hmm. to come into this business and uh, one of the things that I get a lot is that, you know, um, I'm not passionate about this, mm -hmm. right? So, so think about mm -hmm. um, whatever we did, play sports, uh, you know, um, your, your mom put you into chili, whatever the case may be, um, you had to get introduced to something first and then you became passionate about it. No, no, nobody at this table said, hey, I'm gonna be an insurance agent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Or so, be an entrepreneur. Right, right, yeah, entrepreneur, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, entrepreneur yeah. itself. So, um, I, I would say uh, people going into 2024, man, be open, have an open mind, an open heart, and then, uh, you know, find a mentor that, that can lead you down the right path. And, and like my man here said, you know, change your associations. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I would say, I would say definitely have urgency in going after your dreams and goals. Uh, I read a statement that made me look at the word procrastination different. It said, procrastination is your arrogant way of thinking that God owe you more time to do what you had time to do. So we definitely have to make sure that we don't put things off and that we go ahead and get things done this year going into 2024 so that you won't look back on last year and be like, I wish I could have, should have, yeah. would have, could have, should have. Yeah. I, I think, uh, Matt, uh, uh, to answer your question, I think 2024 is the year replacing. Uh, replace your associations, number one. If, you, if I want to if I want to improve in this area, well, you got to find people that they know about that area. Uh, you got to find experts on money. You got to find, just just replace, replace 
uh, uh, novelas, replace movies for uh, books, yeah. for for videos, uh, instead of uh, uh, making all this money to these YouTubers, influencers that they are not teaching you anything. You gotta change that. Talk to people. Watch they can watch your podcast, Patrick and David, so they can educate themselves on that. But everything goes back to us. Like we gotta learn how to replace. Uh, uh, or whatever has not been working because if you're broke obviously it's not working uh, what you've been doing your whole life so we gotta change that change your associations uh, change the meeting that you're attending if instead of going to this party why don't you go to an event of entrepreneurs so you can learn about money uh, and and meetings uh, associations and then also the books that you're reading instead of watching all these uh, uh, magazines on sports and, 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 and consuming right for other people like no learn about magazines about money uh, uh, about uh, how to change, how you can improve. But at the end of the day, like, it has to come from you, making a decision like, I wanna grow, I wanna change, I wanna make money, I wanna improve. But you also need to learn to sacrifice and start doing whatever it takes for you to change uh, uh, and improve on those skills that you can improve in 2024. If not, nothing's gonna change. I would say, say uh, take action. Uh, if somebody wants change in 2024, they have to take action right now. Mm -hmm. You see a lot of people are waiting for the, the new year, new me. Uh, january 1st but that actually starts today it starts now a lot of people want want to make an extra income you know we have people making 40 grand a month 60 grand a month uh but we we just did the math yesterday people can have life-changing results with an extra two to three grand simple as that yeah and something that's crazy is that this industry allows people to do that very part-time so mm -hmm. sometimes people are scared of change but uh, it's a beautiful opportunity that we have here that people can do and make that extra income on a part-time basis. I love it, I yes. love it. I would just add um, definitely uh, looking into purpose-driven things. Yeah. I think um, so much of our life is consumed with scrolling, social media, keeping up with the Joneses, that kind of stuff. And I think it's so important this year for us to start caring about our country, about the people around us. Um, you know, we are the new aunties and uncles, right? So we gotta take over, uh, take over like like our, our economy and really start caring. We have to stop just being so focused on um, superficial things. Um, definitely, I would say reading. There's a book that I would recommend. Uh, it's by um, this guy, Matt Zapala, <laughs> called Gotcha, okay? Yeah, That's yeah, a good place yeah. to start. <laughs> hey, man, appreciate it. Yeah. I gotta meet this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Even those that are watching this, I think there's three types of groups, right? There's doers, there's watchers, and there's those that don't even want to know. <laughs> right? Tuck it under the rug. Ooh, interesting. Exactly. So even this holiday season, people are going to be going into deficit before the year even starts because yeah. they're not seeking yeah. what you're talking about, yeah. which is education. They're seeking more entertainment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So whatever one you are, if you are a doer, seek the education that you need so you can get to the next level. Yeah. All right. If you're a watcher, you're going to keep watching everybody else win. Sure. And if you don't want to know, by the way, for those of you watching, look at the power of this conversation this morning. We're doing this first thing in the morning before everybody's getting here, before everybody has breakfast. And ask yourself this question going into the new year. Is everybody around you, from a financial standpoint, are they a net negative or a net positive? Are they happy to add to your table or are they taken away from your table? One of the things you have to assess. I love, I love your, your thought there about procrastination. I've, I, heard a quote, I heard another quote uh, to add on to you. Is like procrastination is the assassination of your motivation to get you to your final and next destination so we, we all have we have, have places to go and don't let procrastination keep you from getting to those places so yeah. that being said everybody's if, if you want to connect with people that's on this roundtable conversation all their links are in the descriptions below we've been flashing up here in the lower thirds here uh, ever since we started the conversation so make sure you connect with people if we don't have anybody uh, local to you I'm sure that everybody here has somebody in their network in local local office across the country that can help you get educated help you get surrounded with a different group of thinking people. You know, from people that are educated, we got uh, people that are engineers, master's degrees, from the hood, right? Uh, uh, rocking a runway, uh, uh, hitting hoops for a living, to packing grapes. Everybody here, but everybody here is unified by one message. And one message is ownership, taking personal responsibility for their financial situation, not depending on anybody, not leaning on anybody, not procrastinating. And uh, uh, if that is a formula for success, maybe that's something you should consider adopting. So that being said, this bird next to me is starting to wake up too as well. And uh, we're gonna get going here because we're gonna finish off the rest of our day. With that being said, appreciate you guys for tuning in. If you agree with us, you don't agree with us, please put it in the comment section below. If you haven't done so already, make sure you subscribe here to the Seven Fear Squad podcast, like and share. With that being said,
from Fort Lauderdale in the Million Point Bay Shop Retreat. Until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be money smart today. God bless you guys. Bye-bye.